This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. It's both kind and rational To like knowing animals I can't deny it's fashionable To like knowing animals Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I encourage you to join ASA today. Joining comes with a range of benefits including access to their annual competitions. The episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series from Sydney University Press. This is a great collection of books about animal studies. So if you're on your lookout for your next animal related read, do have a look at their website. Some of their books are even open access, which means you can freely and legally download them. Also a quick shout out to Elizabeth Usher, who provided the updated theme tune for Knowing Animals. To learn more about Elizabeth, visit veganthews.com. Now today I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Paul Dobratschik, who is a Manchester based writer, photographer and artist who is also a lecturer at the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. Paul writes about a range of topics in architecture, including architectural theory, architectural history, and the links between architecture and ecology. He's an author or editor of 11 books, and today we're going to talk about his most recent. Animal Architecture, Beasts, Buildings and Us was published by Reaction Books in 2023. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Thank you, Josh. So can you start by telling us what led you to work on the topic of animals and architecture? Yeah, sure. Previous to to the research and the writing for this particular book, I'd worked on a project on anarchism and architecture, anarchism being a sort of libertarian kind of politics that's also generally associated with socialism and socialist collective values. And I'd been occupied with that up until the beginning of COVID, actually, so the beginning of the COVID lockdown. And it sort of, although it doesn't seem like it's a related subject for me, it was there was something about looking at self-built buildings, particularly on in places like eco-villages, of which there are a fair number in, in the UK and, and other countries, and how different their attitude was towards animals and particularly animals that we um, generally don't like. So I went to stay in eco village in, in Wales called Lamas in the guest house. A queen wasp was just beginning to fashion a, a, a nest on the roof of the, of the building, which I found very uncomfortable, <laughs> made me very uncomfortable, but it was also quite beautiful to, to watch this as well. And, and to realize that there, there was no, I wasn't going to be harmed in this happening, right? Even though I felt uncomfortable and, and I think we'd all feel uncomfortable with, with a wasp building its nest right above us in, in our in, in a room. And I think it was that kind of project and some of the things that happened during that project that really led me to think of well, what how can this come come more centre stage in the work that I do? And it was it was COVID that really cemented it, I think, for me as something that seemed right to do at that time, right? Because a, a lot of us, I think, during COVID, during the lockdowns, we were noticing animals <laughs> because animals were appearing because we weren't there. So they were they were much more, became more confident. Uh, and so I found it a very fruitful period of time just to be thinking and looking at animals as a way into this work. I mean, I was, think I was broadly more interested in wider issues of ecology and architecture. So animals for me were and have been just one part of a bigger series of research projects that are, have now embraced plants. So plants I have been working on this past year and I've now moved on to rocks. <laughs> so <laughs> animal, vegetable, mineral but animals was the first because I felt that it fitted just with what was what was kind of happening at that time during COVID, and, and it just felt the a right, a right kind of thing to be studying. 
so it is it is sort of part of this broader kind of interest in ecology which i'm you know is very much coming out of current concerns in many different areas of life to develop more sustainable ways of of living and architecture is very really at the forefront in in some respects of this need to change <laughs> because it contributes so much to to carbon emissions I'm really glad you mentioned that element about sustainability, because there's a recurring tension throughout the book, which to me is fascinating, which is between producing energy efficient homes in the traditional sense and producing homes that welcome animals. Because, of course, there's that difference between do we keep the windows closed to keep the heat in or do we keep the windows open to let the animals come and go? And you often seem to lean towards the latter and say we should be more welcoming to animals. And perhaps for that reason, we would be traditionally understood as being a little less environmentally friendly. Yeah, I mean, that is very much a provocation. It's not really that I would like loads of ants and beetles to come into my house. right? It's more that it's about sort of flagging a fundamental contradiction in many many of the current kind of discourses on what what in sustainable building means that actually it's entirely on human terms <laughs> for me it's not it, it's it, it's kind of missing a vital aspect of changing our relationship changing the changing architecture's kind of ecology as a whole i would say and cities with that as well that is much more about you know a greater sense of openness to an environment that buildings are a part of, but always seek to kind of insulate us from from it, and and necessarily so. But I think it's not a it's an it's an unresolved tension, and it's in the, the unresolvedness of it that I find really interesting and creative. So often, the environmental debates in relation to building seek to find answers, right, and that's totally understandable enough. But in the end, I don't think that produces a, a an enriched relationship between humans and, and other creatures, however we define that. Rather, it continues to have everything to be on our terms. And I think that was the point I was trying to make is that, you know, we, we do have these blind spots in the way we think about ecology. I mean, often for, for very good reasons. But I think there are contradictions really built into the heart of how we conceive of our built environment as opposed to to nature. The opposition itself, right, is a is a major problem. (laughs) And how to sort of soften that boundary, I think, for me, is is the overridingly the most interesting question that I've been asking, actually, also about plants as well. So it's it's that question of softening these boundaries, these hard boundaries that we put in place is really key to what I wanted to do really with, with, with this book and the, and the work on plants. Yes. And another boundary that you want to challenge or suggest is more porous than we typically assume is the distinction between wild and domesticated animals or wild nature and human controlled spaces So is it fair to say, or am I exaggerating to suggest that you reject the idea of wilderness or wildness altogether? I find it problematic. (laughs) So we've just had a a really important series on the BBC, David Natter, probably probably his last series, The Wild Isles, which I think, you know, in its very title, asserts a certain kind of view of, of nature. And throughout that series, there was a tendency to focus on what what is generally in in animal studies are called charismatic animals, right? Often animals that are rare, usually endangered, and somehow in need of a certain kind of story where we are their protectors. We don't ever hear about increases in populations of animals. And I found it, it a really interesting exercise to actually look at that, you know, there are animals that have increased in in numbers, but they're usually animals that we don't see or don't regard as charismatic. I mean, the creatures like rats, for instance, probably the most extreme example. But in a sense, we are, when we talk about nature, almost always we have a hierarchical 
structure in in our minds and that's often reinforced by really well-meaning popular programs like David Attenborough series which I think are open there I think they're open to challenge because they I think what I find is they they tend to present quite a reassuring image of nature as distant from us right in some in some fundamental way because they're not focusing on animals and other creatures and living beings that are right up against our faces <laughs> which in in cities most of the animals move counter are and so it, in, it interests me this particular kind of image of nature which is being continually constructed and reiterated it's not that i'm against wildness but wildness itself has a kind of contradictory meaning right i remember a few years ago i was doing research on on ruins ruined building abandoned buildings and explorers of abandoned buildings have this perfect image that they want to discover a kind of time capsule building where they go in no one else has been in it before and they do not get that this going in the building disturbs that idea right and i think it's the same with wild that we again it's on our own terms and we're not really understanding that we are already part wherever we go in the world we are we are making it not wild if you like and in a sense it it's it's again it's a it's an image that we have that we that we that we're constructing and, and i do it as well right you know there's the spaces i really prefer when i go out walking are wild spaces but that's about me it's not about the place <laughs> It's about what I want and what I want to see and what I want to experience, which I think is very much a legacy of certain kinds of ways of thinking about nature that have become quite dominant, romantic period, right? And that very much kind of affecting and affect, you know, now affecting very, very, almost everything that is to do with nature in terms of how nature is managed and, and governed by, by humans. Now, it's really interesting because I see, having read your book, what all of this has to do with architecture. But I think some people listening in might be thinking, but where does the architecture come in? So on Knowing Animals, I'm always really keen to draw attention to conversations about animals that are taking place in disciplines that listeners might not be expecting. So let me just ask a kind of very foundational question. What's the relevance of animals to architecture as an academic discipline? Well, at, at the moment, I mean, not very much. <laughs> you know, there are a few books. There's two main main areas that I would see. On the one hand, there are sources on animals that build. And there are a, a, a large, well, not a large, a, you know, a small number of animals that build for themselves. Birds are the most obvious, birds' nests. But things like termites, ants, bees, beavers as well. Mm. So there's that aspect, a quite a literal sense of animals as builders, which I was interested in and does inform the book on one level. The other side is either buildings that we build for animals, and that usually means livestock, so it usually means farm buildings of one kind or another, or zoos, animals that are there for humans to as a, as a form of entertainment, or animals that we allow into our houses. <laughs> usually pets right of one kind or another and how that causes a certain kind of relationship so I was interested in all of those three but I was also interested in more than that so unintentional animal interactions so that that wasp that I talked about earlier just deciding that it was a good space to construct a nest uh, and those things are happening all the time. And usually those are things that we really don't like, that we respond negatively to. Mm. But I was, I'm also interested, and I think this is something which is carried through all of the work that I do, is how we imagine animals and buildings. And it's often in things like science fiction or fantasy writing where you could really experiment with different ideas that are often quite wild and strange but which I think can enrich and add to existing ideas of how we think about the relationship. So it's this sort of, you know, continuum, I would say, of um, engagements 
which I'm interested in and trying to make links between them as well, which is quite new in a sense that there are certain scholars that are doing this in relation to certain animals. You know, thinking of like Don, someone like Donna Haraway and dogs, you know, how she talks quite a lot about all of these different kinds of animal dog relationships, which often people do not want to talk about the animals in labs, for instance, uh, which I find very interesting. But generally, I think architects, when they think about animals, they generally think about either animals that make structures or, uh, or, or structures that we build for animals. So what I, what, I, what I want to do is really enrich this and bring in and, and make a sort of bigger whole set of correspondences uh, between animals and buildings, which also includes cities, which I mm. see as a kind of agglomeration of buildings, right, as a sort of architecture, architectural subject as well. Yes, and I liked what you said about thinking about buildings and cities and other spaces from animals' points of view. So I think perhaps a nice example of this came out most clearly in your chapter on birds. And I should say that the book, of course, is set out different kinds of animals. Yeah. Rather than different kinds of buildings, it moves through different kinds of animals. And I like the way you foreground the animals there. In this chapter on birds, you talk about the way we could rethink cities if we think about them from an aerial point of view. So what would that look like? I mean, the very first building that I introduced in the book was, was Jean Gang's Aqua skyscraper in Chicago, which she designed deliberately to, to, to stop birds flying into it because our glass buildings, birds aren't really able to s- sort of see them properly. So, it's, you know, millions of birds die every year just flying into glass skyscrapers. And she used a sort of certain kind of fritted pattern on the windows to create a sort of an effect which made the birds able to recognise that this was an obstacle rather than something to just keep going. I mean, I, I was rather negative about it, saying this is quite a low bar to set, right? Not to kill, not to kill animals. You, you wouldn't if you had a building that didn't kill a human, it wouldn't win an award, right? <laughs> <laughs> That building has won lots of awards. So it, it's, to me, it was an interesting starting point. That's one example where you, you just, you're giving it a consideration, which, you know, but that tells you a lot about the, the complete obliviousness to, to killing animals that often buildings have within them, right? Which I, I, I that was the point I was making. Um, but, you know, other ways are actually imagining a viewpoint isn't isn't well I'm not saying it's the same thing as we can actually know how a pigeon for instance sees the city but the very act of thinking about it and and you know using your imagination is I would regard as a kind of sympathetic exercise and this goes back it actually goes back to you know early romantic ideas of Wordsworth and Coleridge beginning of the 19th century, where they use this word sympathetic imagination to describe, you know, that imagination can be an act of sort of ethical act of actually getting to know something else because you want to care about it. And I think that in itself can produce a different way of seeing that takes into account in a caring way what other animals might be perceiving. So it's it's a way of trying to identify, even though it's obviously very flawed. I think another way is 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 to think of buildings as a kind of in the way that animals might think of them. So the, the, the one of my favourite pieces that I wrote in that book was on peregrine falcons, and peregrine falcons they, they would look at a skyscraper as a kind of cliff, <laughs> you know, which is which is their idea of an ideal place to build at their nests, and it's one of the reasons why there are so many peregrine falcons now nesting on tall buildings they usually like stone buildings rather than steel and glass buildings but that's not because they you know it's a completely different response to a building than a, a songbird for instance so I find it really interesting how we might begin to think of buildings as through I guess the idea that animals are trying to find 
a home or trying to find a place to for, to be a home, whether they build it or not. And that our buildings might be that and often are that. And how we can kind of just simply become more aware of what that means in our buildings. You know, as example I have just just actually just below my where, where I'm speaking from here is uh, some some sparrows are nesting in a in a tile, but they're doing it because the tile is 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 raised up, and it and 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 actually shouldn't be. <laughs> it's not really doing its job if it's raised up, but in a in a way, it's not. I've not done anything. I've not done anything active to to encourage that, apart from maybe not repairing my roof. <laughs> Which, of course, you know, is in a long term against my interests, but for the interest of the sparrow. So, it, you know, um, I think the point I would make with that is that it's not a comfortable, it's not a comfortable relationship there. One has to sort of be prepared to work through that as a kind of, it's a competing interest in a way. You've mentioned thinking about animals as architects and thinking about animals as builders, but is there potentially also room for thinking about animals as buildings? Well, I guess one, yeah, I mean, in in, in a certain sense, there's a few examples that that I use in the book. A really interesting one that I I found was the way in which there might be a relationship between the discovery of dinosaur bones and skeletons in the mid 19th century and the development of the idea of a structural skeleton of a building which didn't really exist until the late 19th century where you see steel and iron being used in a sort of structural skeleton frame and I find it intriguing that it's just at the point or just a few decades after the discovery of dinosaur bones where we're seeing animals simply as skeletons and having to reconstruct them as skeletons, which is a kind of weirdly an architectural exercise in understanding how a skeleton works. And the display of these skeletons, one of the great places I I, I refer to in the book is the Oxford Museum, where a lot of these early dinosaur studies were were really centred, and how the, the, the structure of the interior of the building seems to have some kind of relationships in the iron and glass interior has a relationship with the, with the dinosaur bones and other mammal bones that are on display. And I find really, really intriguing. I guess the other thing as well is where we use products of animals as building materials. There is a project now in New York's harbour to use and, and grow oyster reefs, which are effectively the shells of mollusks that are inside the shells, which are the oysters, that grow on top of each other over many, many decades to make an a, a, an organic reef to protect New York from rising sea levels and increased flooding from, from larger storms as well. And that's actually being, being carried out. Tens of millions of oysters are being grown artificially and then will be put into the, the harbour to, to, to build this reef. And I find that to be a really interesting example of I mean, it's infrastructure rather than architecture, but it is a building process where the oysters are the builders. <laughs> so actually, it's kind of interesting notion of actually animals doing the work. And therefore, do they have rights? Do they have rights as workers? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bizarre question in, in many ways. And we also might say the same for beavers as well. So beavers are now being reintroduced in the UK and other countries in order specifically to turn areas into a certain kind of wetland that will help with flooding in the future. And beavers do this by building dams and the dams are effective. They're doing it for themselves, right? That's what beavers do, but they're also doing it for us. And it it is these really interesting questions are raised about well, who's the builder? <laughs> who's the architect? Who's the builder here? It's again, it's a blur, blurred boundary, which um, I found find really fascinating, but also not a little disturbing in terms of well, how far will that? Get, how far is is that potentially going to go? 
Before I move on to the regular questions, I wanted to raise something that, from a kind of animal rights or vegan perspective, might raise some eyebrows in your book. And yeah. that is that you are quite open to certain forms of animal agriculture, but you want to support an animal centric approach to farm building or agricultural architecture. Could you explain what that means? Yeah, I mean, I should say that although I'm not a a vegan or a strict vegetarian doing research on factory farming systems is by far the best way of putting you off eating meat Mm. i have to say and it's not it it, it's it's an upsetting thing to have to research and i found it very difficult and in a way ending the book in the way that I did on on chickens, which I, I think have the worst fate of any form of livestock, was was di- was difficult. But I think there are the question I was asking also was a challenge for architects to actually get more engaged with this, you know, because they're not, you know, it's a very it's not seen as an area that architects generally will work in, even though architects will design zoos. Uh, it's quite famous architects have designed zoo structures very, very few will will become involved in buildings for livestock. You know, the central question is, can intensive forms of livestock, husbandry, be married with animal welfare? However we define that, it's a very tough question. Some architects, I think, have taken it on and are trying to produce smaller scale farming structures which allow for you know a a design that is both utilitarian but also humane in a certain sense but clearly that's not going to fully address the scale of factory farming and the and the reasons why it exists in the first place which is a kind of insatiable growth in demand for meat and poultry so i would be totally um you know, on board with the desire to drastically reduce our consumption of both meat and poultry, even if that doesn't mean giving up altogether, simply because the scale is is the biggest problem in terms of achieving any kind of um, humane treatment of animals. But it's also, there's something pretty important about just knowing, (laughs) you know, it's difficult, upsetting, but in a way, turning away from it is does not really present much of an opportunity for you to change your attitudes and as I've already said I think the biggest way of changing your attitude is to just understand a little bit more um, difficult as that may be. Now Paul we ask every guest on Knowing Animals five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Sure. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? I'm going to say The Peregrine by J.A. Baker, but written in the 1950s. And I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's pro animal. It was more like absolutely obsessed by an animal scholarship. And it, well, well, it's not scholarship. It's, it's, a, it's a memoir of an obsession with a peregrine, fol- several peregrine falcons, by someone who was relatively unwell at the time and was... You know, in a way, it's become a familiar type of nature book, the idea of nature cure. In this book, it's, it, it, it kind of is that, but it's also something far more intense and disturbing. A, a man really trying to identify entirely with, a, with the perceptual world of a peregrine falcon. And I found it very interesting as a, a particularly intense form of imaginative engagement that produced this sort of really odd strange prose you know the writing itself seems to become determined to to Mm -hmm. to see from the point of view of a a peregrine even though that sounds completely ridiculous it's it, it it seems to work in this book because it's he's so committed so that book to me was was a real and i read that when i was quite young so it, it, it wasn't directly connected to this work, but I have used it in, in the book because it, it left such an impression on me. And can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yes, well, I, the first piece I wrote for the book was on beetles. And it seems like a, appropriate, given that beetles don't build, they're usually a pest, and they usually 
eat stuff that we don't want them to eat. That's why they're in our in our houses. And it seemed like a really appropriate place to start in terms of a provocative way of trying to think about well, what how can we <laughs> how can we change that? And I'm not and one of the ways I did it was to think about fictions about beetles. Kafka's great story metamorphosis which is probably about a beetle rather than a cockroach, even though the two th- we tend to think of the two things as the same. And also a wonderful novel. I, I, I read South African novelist Henrietta, Henrietta Rose Inners about a beetle infestation. You know, how, can, how we can get richness out of this very discomforting idea of things infesting rather than just coming in nicely and (laughs) cordially, if you like. Yes, I wrote down in my notes that you said that we should be ready to accommodate and accept woodworm, which I thought was a particularly provocative suggestion for an audience who might be used to trying to eradicate them. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. You know, perhaps I need to have woodworm to, to be able to say that. And it's different depending on the the, the beetle. But it does, it it often takes decades. So there is this sort of, you know, a lot of it is the anxiety that we have about these processes going on, which obviously we'd rather not happening. But sometimes our anxieties doesn't really reflect the reality, perhaps. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Tim Ingold, not directly an animals scholar. Tim Tim Ingold was an anthropologist, but he was one of the first, really, to to write about animals as persons and as social beings. So there's, a, you know, in recent years, this is, this is a very commonplace idea of nature, culture being not two separate things. But Tim Ingold was 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 writing about this in the 1980s, quite a long time before anyone else. And I and I think for me, he's he's the most poetic, most positive writer I think that talks about developing links between humans and more than human that's really accessible and really really beautiful as well often this stuff is quite dense and impenetrable and I find Tim Ingold a really refreshing kind of antidote to that even though he's very scholarly as well. (laughs) What do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? Well, for me, I think it was quite a basic attentiveness, developing attentiveness, which is a very active form of awareness, but is also not distanced. So it, 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 attentiveness, I think, is, is about a kind of faith that a correspondence can be developed rather than a sort of distant form of observation for me that for for academics anyway I think that's a really essential part of the process the other is something I mentioned in in the introduction to the book is perhaps a different kind of ontology am I allowed to use that word (laughs) (laughs) different kind of sense of how things exist and a more equal acknowledgement of existence of other beings and, and animals are probably the, the closest we would generally assume to us, all right? It's, it gets more complicated when we start to think about plants and then rocks, which I'm thinking about now. But animals, it seems obvious to me that we should acknowledge their existence as an equal kind of existence. But that's a very radical place to start, actually, in terms of then, then how do we act? If you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? I think what I would say is, and this is very personal thing, but it it runs throughout the book is increasing our tolerance of disorder and again this this goes right back to the work on anarchism, where a lot of the the resistance to anarchism is a perception of chaos. Right, which is partly misconstrued in relation to the politics of anarchism, but partly kind of correct in terms of that we have a natural disinclination towards disorder. And animals 
are the very kind of epitome of disorder because that's exactly what they bring into our lives anyone who has a pet knows this <laughs> I, I have a dog and it's it's every day it's the disorder of the dog right a greatest tolerance of this in relation to all kinds of animals i think is the what you know the the thing that i would like to see changed but it is a, a very personal thing right some people have very disabling fears of animals like spiders that i wouldn't presume that they, that i would say they have to change that but anything that we can do i think to move towards a greater tolerance of what i call disorder would be in my eyes be a very welcome thing in the built environment i know i've nodded to this a couple of times already but what are you working on next at the at the so i've just finished a writing a book on plants and architecture which it, it sort of takes this subject and, and, and applies it to a sort of different kind of order of of life and and now i'm thinking about rocks so it's, it's a sort of in a way, also, it's sort of moving down the perceptual framework of life where we don't think of rocks as alive. We generally probably think of plants as alive, but certainly that's quite recent. Generally, think of animals as alive, just in order to, to push those boundaries that I, you know, I have in my mind as well and, and to be a bit more open to what comes out of that. So rocks are my current subject and I'm busy learning about different geological eras at the moment <laughs> how can people find out more about your work uh, i do have a website um which is has been called this name for a long period of time ragpickinghistory.co.uk and also you can find me on the on the bartlett's school of architectures website where where i teach well thanks so much paul for joining us for this podcast thank you very much josh it's been a pleasure and thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. You can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at Knowing Animals. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at A Vegan Philosopher. Please do tell others about us and review the podcast where you found it. And if you're teaching, do include some episodes of Knowing Animals on your reading lists. I'm Josh Milburn, and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.